Welcome back. Thank you for hanging out with us. This is the one and only IT in the D show. My name is Bob Walton Spiel, hanging out with producer, co-host extraordinaire, Randy Walker. Guest this week, you might know him as the CIO of Hansons. You might know him from Michigan Technology Leaders or Sim Detroit or Angels of Hope. The one and only Steve York is in the house. This is his first podcast he's ever recorded. We we're very lucky to have him in, uh, as a guest. But hey, you can find us online at IT in the D dot com do us a favor give us a like on the socials subscribe to us everywhere find podcasts are sold don't forget meetup.com slash it and we just had our first event of the year last week at the eastern palace club out in hazel park phenomenal venue really cool people um i think we're gonna stay there for a while until at least summer breaks and then we'll figure it out um but i like it there, yeah Randy. yeah we'll be back there again on february 15th steve how you doing how they treating you buddy you know, Bob, I can't complain. Uh, life is good. We're recording on Monday after the Detroit Lions had an historic victory. I, I'll be honest with you. I don't know. You're about, you're close to my age. I don't know. But what, like, the last time they won a playoff game, I was a senior in high school. And it's been years and years of garbage. And uh, we were gifted to have two playoff victories in a row. And uh, I can't, I can't, I'm the happiest guy in the world. I, so I can't imagine what this town's going through. Listen, uh, I think I was a sophomore in college in, when that happened. So it's it's been a lot of years. Uh, and and listen, and that's on the heels of Michigan winning the Natty. Yeah. So how, how it, it's been a good week in Detroit. It doesn't feel real. Right? That was uh, my favorite picture. It was like a five year old kid eating a pizza with a Michigan shirt and a Lions head. Like this kid had a good week, and I'm like, yeah, that, that's it, it. he had a very good week. Right. I, uh, now we just got we got to look forward to Sunday. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's uh, it doesn't feel real. I'm, I'm trying to take it all in. I'm trying to take it all in. So, um, so I got to dive in real quick. I always love the, the questions, you know, obviously being a CIO of Hanson's, um, does that, that jingle has got to sit in your head all day. It doesn't matter. Your buddy's got to razz you. Uh, I, yeah, listen, I, I have vent, I have vendors that get on calls and start the call by singing the jingle. Oh no. And I tell people, once you know it, you really can't get it out of your head. You and so I, it's it's regular. I get into a call with somebody and they start wiggling their finger to tell me, I, I know your jingle. Yeah, well, it's, so, you know, at the end of the day, it's like quintessential Detroit. It's like a, you know, it's like a Mike Morse billboard, Jumana. It's like a, you know, those, it's the get on the right track to nine mile and Mac. I mean, it's the, it's, yeah. you know, it's a local it's a, it's it's the jingle. If you don't know what it is, it's one eight hundred hands. I mean, you'll never forget the commercial. Now, listen, Bri- Brian Elias, who was the founder of Hansons, uh, did an incredible job with the brand. Um, we're private equity owned now. We're owned by here on Capital in Detroit, and uh, you know we've had a good run, and I think uh, good things to come. You know, we've, we're expanding rapidly. Uh, we, we're in seventeen branches in ten states, and in. Q1 of this year, we're going to be in 20 branches in 12 states. So business, the business is taking off. I had, we had, I I bet you've asked anyone on the street, like no idea, like you guys want multiple states. We always thought you were just local around here. So that's, that's crazy. That's great news. You know, private equity has, uh, has a a way of kind of infusing that growth. Um, And so, yeah, I've got a great leadership team. I've got a great technology team. We're doing great things and uh, 24 is going to be a great year. So what's the biggest difference? So you came, I've known you through a couple of different firms, being an IT leader, uh, you know, a couple of local companies, man, you know, uh, managed service provider. Um, now you're part of a, you know, this is retail slash commercial. Um, is there any difference on on how you think technology wise? Um, or are you just uptime is king and, and making sure that, you know, everything's user friendly for you. I mean, what's, uh, what are, what are some of the key differences you've been seeing over the, uh, throughout your, throughout your career? I think most of those opportunities were, were private equity owned. And so there's been a lot of private equity and in, in my last five or six opportunities have been tied to that. I think private equity moves faster. I think a lot of it is about customer experience. Um, uptime is, is table stakes, right? You, you sure. got to get in, you, you got to find problems. You got to, you got to make the, the engine's got to run. But when the engine starts to run, uh, you know, you get an opportunity to rebuild customer mobile apps for your sales team that, that drive customer experience. So, I, you know, I, I like to solve problems in IT, but I also like to get out in the business. 
And when you get out in the business, you get a chance to really, uh, you know, shift, shift the way we do things. So you're in an interesting situation where your customers are 20 somethings. You have mid, you know, mid people like, like me. Um, and then you also have people like, you know, my mom, my folks that, you know, they're in their eighties and obviously you want to push the envelope technology, technology wise, but how do you maintain, I guess, keeping all the, you know what I'm saying? Everyone in the, in the technology life cycle, keeping them all happy while you're trying to give them the best experience possible. Uh, I, I think COVID taught us a lot, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. We had to do virtual appointments for the first time in the company's history. Um, but we, we've had to pivot through lots of different situations, right? I think the, the, the opportunity for Hanson's is this. You, you can purchase a home improvement project and get a lifetime guarantee. You know, we say internally, we help you love where you live. I, I, I don't care if you're a millennial or you're a, a, a boomer. You, you have to protect your single largest investment. And I think that's where Hanson's has um, done well, right? You get a lifetime guarantee on those. Who wants to go through that more than once? If you've got a trusted partner, uh, a lifetime guarantee means just that. And so, um, you know, we've also moved inside the house in the last year. We now do tub to shower conversions. So, you know, our our whole goal and, and the vision of the team is we want to help you love where you live. But we want to help you in a lot of different ways. I think we'll expand product offerings beyond bath. Uh, we're going to look at front doors this year, entry doors. It's the first impression of your home. Sure. Uh, we use a lot of technology for those who want to use it. Um, but we'll still send the sales guy out. I mean, the iPad drives the, the, the deal. So we built technology that an appointment comes in and the sales executive can do turn-by-turn navigation to your house. And then the iPad flow... Uh, you know, we've built a platform called Hero Home Improvement Renovation Options, which really just we've got 130 salespeople across the country. H- how do we keep them in between yellow lines and how do we monitor positive customer experiences? We use a lot of technology for that, but the customer doesn't see all that technology. Well, that's what I'm saying. The millennials, they want all of it. The 3D renderings, the what is my house going to look like? You pick some colors and my mom, you know, if, if you tell her you're going to we're going to fax it, she's going to be like, what's a fax? You know what I'm saying? So it's like you know, hitting all those different, but it sounds like, you know, no, you answered it, you know, at least you have it available if they want it. But, uh, you know, I, I was just curious as to, you know, uh, I guess you just got to feel out your customers, right? Yeah. And that's, that's really the, the, we, we, we will still do a virtual or an in-home appointment, right? That's important because some people are comfortable buying online some, but I think if we've learned anything through COVID, you can have a car delivered to your driveway. Yeah. Right, you sign you sign electronic, and they they drop keys off and off they go, and you're you're now a proud car owner. So, you know, I think the whole you know COVID's forced the whole world to shift. More people went online to learn and worship and see their doctor, and I think it's it's here to stay. I think yeah, and, and what they're doing is they're giving the choice. Like I was telling my buddy, I was so lazy this past weekend. I think I got DoorDash four times. Um, between or getting bagels for, you know, I didn't want to leave the house and, you know, the whole contact list delivery, um, it curb, was cold outside. Right? Yeah. Was cold out I, there. Curbside delivery. I mean, I was complaining that I just stick two two bare feet on the porch to grab my bagels. Like, oh, oh, oh life is, you know, uh, we, we become, sp- we did get spoiled and the companies had to evolve around us and our preferences. Like, what is, how many different ways is Target now? You have, you know, curbside, you can have stuff delivered, you can have, you know, you can go in the store right. traditional. Um, and now there's a tip for the uh, automated uh, teller. Is that, is that, I've heard, I don't believe it. I haven't seen it yet. Have you seen it? I haven't seen that one yet. I mean, I, I think it's what, what's, what we have is customer choice. Sure. You can choose, you can choose whether you want to drive up and they load it in your trunk or they drive up and leave it on your porch. You pay a little bit for that. And that's created, that's created additional income for a lot of folks in, in, in those service industries. But, uh, you know, I, look, I, I love to go every week and pull up to Kroger and they drop my groceries in the trunk. Mm-hmm. I, I don't, I don't go, I don't want to go to the store anymore. Right. I'm busy. And so if I can, if I can take an hour of walking through the store out of my life, I know what I want. Sure, sure. Let me pull. Let, let me pull up. Drop in the. Drop in the trunk. Off I go. Right. So we've been uh, the topic of the last what, Randy? Three months has been AI, obviously. 
Uh, yeah. A lot of us knew it through a lot of different variations moving forward, but it, it's 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 here. Um, we've heard you know a hundred different use cases from a hundred different experts so far. Um, we haven't talked yet in your world, in your sector, home improvement, you know, uh, retail manufacturing. What have you messed around with it yet? Do you see any use cases? What what what's on the horizon for AI in in your world? Yeah, you know, we're we're dipping our toe in the water. Um, I, I think there's a lot of AI experts out there. Everybody's got AI connected to their name now. Very quick. I think there's, very quick. I think yeah. I think there's going to be a watershed moment, and in 12 months, we'll see some real, you know, kind of meat and potatoes around it. Uh, we're piloting a pro- uh, a product called Rilla Voice, which uh, a sales executive can run this app on their phone while they're in home pitching to the customer. Uh, it'll score the appointment. It'll compare them to successful or unsuccessful. Wow. It it will give a sales manager the ability to do a ride along without ever getting in the car. He can go dissect that whole appointment, leave specific notes at specific points. Uh, but more importantly, what it's given us the ability to do is it's tough to break into home improvement from a sales perspective. You know, and a lot of people come in and they're hungry to learn. Well, if I can go listen to 10 successful sales calls, my my sales calls will be successful because I'm going to know what the recipe is. And so we look at things like how much does the sales executive talk? How much does the customer? There, there, there's important metrics there. Yeah. Uh, so 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 we're we're dabbling in it. But you know, I, I've also had companies approach me and say, "We can AI your universe." And okay, really? <laughs> Come on. I I, th- I think there's a lot of hype cycle to it right now. Uh, you know, I'm excited. I think the big players. The big players will invest and buy where they need to to remain to be big players. So you have to look at Microsoft and and Google and Zoom. These platforms will do well with AI. Um, they have to because everybody that rides those platforms is looking for that innovation. But more importantly, those OEMs are looking for a revenue stream. So it's sure it's co-pilot, right? Everything is now it's as a service. And look, I think it's it's here to stay. I could post something on LinkedIn and put my words in and hit a button and they make it sound prettier. That, that's great, right? That's going to be good in, in business. Is it going to really transform business at this point? We'll, we'll write nicer email notes. I think that's what we'll see. I think, uh, well, I mean, obviously with, with me on, the, on a day job side being consulting, we're doing a lot. We're looking at a lot of um, things in manufacturing floors, digital twinning, looking for optimization, uh, supply chain. That That's where we're really seeing the use cases that are like, okay, this one works because it's, you know, it's taking machine learning. It's taken in another step. It's looking at our business. It's trying to make, uh, you know, it's, it's actually having impact. And I think that's where it's not a cute little toy to look at the shiny, shiny blinking lights, right? This is something that if it doesn't impact your bottom line, like don't even talk to anyone about it. Cause that's what exactly. I, I tell a lot, I tell a lot of consulting companies, right? Here are my business problems. Bring me an AI model that solves those. I'm willing to let's go, right? Let's yeah. do a proof of concept. I, I think it's there's still a lot to to wash out. Um, you know, we use abnormal security. There's a great use of AI. It learns my internal users' behaviors, who they communicate with, the tone and inflection they communicate with. And by golly, if they haven't communicated with an entity before that wants to send them something really bad, it never hits the user's mailbox. Sure. So from my so from my perspective, hey, that's a phenomenal use case for it. But Microsoft should be doing that. I shouldn't have to go buy a third party product to do that. It's, they will it's, just give it a minute, you know. Exactly. Yeah, that's that's kind of how I see that. Like this rule of voice, it's a great little startup. Somebody's going to let them get some wheels underneath them and they'll become, it'll become part of zoom or it'll become part of some phone platform that people say, Hey, you know, zoom's got their own, uh, revenue accelerator module. It, it, it's a foot race out there, right? There's the, all these tools doing all the same things. One of them or two of them will, will kind of emerge as the ones who's invested smartly, got the right customer feedback and built a, a, a tool that's not, it can't be the, the problem with these tools. It can't be too industry specific because where's the scale come if it's sure. a purple squirrel, right? Sure. We, we've they've, they've got to be more uh, vanilla in nature. Uh, you know, w- we're concerned with AI because I don't I don't want my users. My users are talented 
human beings with hammers and nails and things like that. But when you talk about building language mod, mod models out there, I don't really want a lot of my corporate data inadvertently, you know, leaked into these. So, so that's where we've taken, we, we've got some controls in place where, look, if you want to play with it on your own individual phone, great. We, we don't let you do a lot of that on the network because it's just too risky for us. There's, there's too many privacy concerns and, and just too many things around the corner that, you know, you have to just be cautious about. No, you hit the nail on the head and the security being number one and number two is data quality. And, you know, we, I sat in front of a, a big automotive company that we all know and love. And that's the first thing they said is, you know, everybody that comes in here pitching AI to us, the second thing they do is go, oh, yeah, and you need to fix that shit. And, <laughs> and they're like, well, n- now that I've gone down that rabbit hole, why don't I just fix that to, you know, and now you just got me down doing 17 projects when, you know, we're trying to just do one thing. But like, yeah, you're, you hit the nail on the head with the security thing. That's everybody's biggest issue right now. I, I think I, I think that's where my bigger concerns lie with AI, right? Um, cool that we can get some business innovation with it, but bad guys move faster. Yeah, yeah. Well, that <laughs> I, was uh, when did we talk about this, Randy? The the one the hallucination where it just made up some total complete bullshit, and then they asked it why, and they said, "Well, that's what we thought you wanted to hear," and we're like, yeah. "You're not supposed to think." <laughs> Ty- Listen, I. I I, I knew we were in trouble with AI when the law student helped it write a paper and the AI model just made up cases and, and, and we didn't go validate those, right? We submitted that paper. Was that a different one with the lawyer? Because apparently some lawyer wrote all his cases and submitted them to court and they caught him. Like, oh my God, you know, having kids, I know, I think you got a couple of kids in college too. I'm like, I go, Gretchen, so help me God, if you get thrown out of school for having chat GPT write your paper, I'll kill you. Well, but my son has told me they have to they have to submit papers through engines to their professors, which grade the degree of originality based on public sources. Jeez. So it's there, right? Yeah, yeah. And I think and and I think those use cases make sense. Uh, you know, like I said, I I think a lot of this moves much faster than the controls do, and the cybersecurity ability for cyber teams to respond. That's the challenge is you're, you're, you're introducing this new sizzleware in your environment, but nobody really knows, you know, how that dog operates off the leash. I like that term sizzleware. It, it, that's, that, that's to me what it is, right? Everybody's yeah. got, you know, I was at a conference on the west side of the state and, and literally one of the speakers said, everybody you will meet today is, is pitching AI. Yeah. <laughs> everybody, whether it's real or not, they're here well, pitching it. It was, uh. You know, back in what, 2016-ish, I worked for a machine learning security firm, right? That kind of, instead of looking at raw logs, it was putting a puzzle together. People are calling that AI now. And it's like, well, you know, is it, you know, it's, right now it's taken the shape and form of way too many things. And it became, I remember one of my favorite podcasts I ever had, he was uh, the CIO of a major healthcare company we all know and love. And all he talked about was innovation and digital transformation. And I'm like, well, what, what, what is that really? And we always joked about that. That term was like so overused in the industry and it meant nothing to anyone. Like, again, if you're not solving a business problem, what the hell are you talking to me for? And- I, I look at, I look at it and I, and there's so much of that hype in the market, right? So much hype of these, what the tool can do, but it, you got to bring that right back to, is it going to solve my business problem? Sure. And is it easy? Is it easy to use this to solve my business problem? Because if you're trying to solve a complex business problem with a complex tool, good luck with that. Right. Well, right? everybody wanted that. to, everyone wanted to talk chatbot, and like me as a user, I tried it this weekend with the, with the Verizon, with Verizon, it's like wait times were 20 minutes and I want to order the new phone and I need to, to clear up some stuff in my account. Anyway, I tried the chat bot and it was hot garbage, you know, and I finally just said like, I'm sorry, I went down this route. I'm just going to go to a store. Like I'm, I, I, I think it's overused in some of those cases too, right? In, in a situation where you just need to speak to a human being. Yeah. They, they would be better off to get you to the human being as opposed to wasting your time down the rabbit hole of the chat bot, trying to understand exactly what prompts they have for what your problem is. Well, we talked about that with uh, with the VP of PR for Comcast a lot where she, I'm like, you know, when you do the automated shit, all we're going to yell is representative over and over until we get to speak to somebody. 
And I go, just, just, right. just, just have somebody answer it. It's, it's, but the customer experience is we, we don't let you do that. We shut off representative. We, we, when you hit zero, it yeah. spins you back to oh, say, yeah. and that's, that's not a, an acceptable response here, right? No, and I they don't want to make it easy. I get what they're trying to do, but all you have to do is put in like 10 level one agents and just go, Hey, your job is to say, Hey, what can I, what, what do you need? Cool. You're going to talk to Timmy. You're going to talk to Susie. You know what I mean? Like instead of going through that, and that's one thing that needs a, a huge overhaul is, is um, all the companies that are doing uh, call center stuff. Like I, the, the user experience, it's never been good. Like I can't tell you when's the last time anyone's ever had a good experience except for not talking, except for actually talking to someone. We run a call center at, at my company. Sure. Uh, I think, I think it's one of those challenging things because you know, you're responding to leads. You try to call customers. How does your number appear on their phone? Do they even realize it's you calling, right? It, it, there's a lot of technology smashed together. And I think where a lot of companies have done is just lost focus on the true customer experience. Because, I mean, look what Delta's done. I'm a huge Delta fan, flown that airline for 25 years, right? They kind of got out of the rat race and said, hey, if you call in and we can't get, we'll call you back or we can message with you. And I'm sure their messaging agents are handling, it's a 10 to one ratio, right? 10 customer interactions for every messaging. Yes. But at least I know I'm, it's responsive. Yeah. And so you you like, you like the, the innovation there over letting me sit in a black hole. Even Delta gets overrun. I've called in where they said, hey, uh, we'll call you back in 26 hours. Ouch. Just, just once I want to hear, what kind of music do you like? Oh, I like <laughs> I, I like sweet jazz. And they play jazz music as my whole music. Just once. Just give, as, me, give as, me something. As opposed to the, ele- the the horrible elevator music they like to play. It's not even good music. It's just like no, that. It's, that uh. it's, 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 des- it's designed to not let you get mad. <laughs> so it's that, it's that soft, bluesy, or jazzy music. Right. So you, you you can't get hyped up because the music you're like oh my god this that's is that, horrible that miles teller commercial where he starts dancing to it or like no dude no one's ever done that ever ever so you wonder they're not doing it now so getting back to the hell that is living in the vendor world because that's obviously the world i lived in for all, all my life um how do you make do on on you know what's uh who do you talk to and who don't you? Because, you know, I, I had a CISO on and we looked at just the vendor matrix for security and it's just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of logos. And how do you make sense of it? And then, you know, in your world, obviously you, you own all the technology. So you, you're, you get everybody. Yeah. Um, I mean, I listen, I mean, I'm inundated, but I firewall myself from it. Right? Sure. I had a guy reach out today and he said, Hey, I, I went to your, he sent me a message on LinkedIn. He said, Hey, I called your company and I tried to reach you through your IVR and, and your name is not in the IVR. And I said, that, 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 <laughs> oh, that's, shit. that's by, that's by design, <laughs> yeah. right? That's by design. Uh, you know, I, I think here's the reality. I've been doing this for a long time and I've got sure. trusted partners and I rely on my partners to, to talk to me about what they're seeing. Um, you know, Sim Detroit, 260 plus local leaders, right? I'm in the shadows of some giants. There's companies in the Detroit area, Penske Automotive Group or uh, Borg Warner, right? They spend more money in R&D than I spend it for, for all of my expenses. So sure. I'm, I'm not one of those fancy logo shops, right? I'm an old school guy that says, hey, keep it simple. If the bad guys can't get in, if your systems are patched and you've got controls in place, um, you know, I don't give my users admin privileges to their laptops. Bad things happen when you do that. Yeah. So I, I think from my perspective, we just kind of focus on basic hygiene, right? We've got good tools and controls. You know, I don't, I don't pass out my, 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 my map, right? That, that's, that's too much information just to show out there to anybody who wants to see what your vendor footprint. So I, yeah, you know, I, Cybersecurity to me is simple. Patch your systems. Know, know who you're underpinning your supply chain risks are. Um, your greatest risks walks in and out of your door every day. Yeah. So fo- focus on having honest conversations with your people. Train your people. Test your people. You know, We have all of those tools in place where we test them every month. It's painful for them, I'm sure, at times, but I only test them because the things they're tested on are the real-world stuff that happens. Uh, we, we, we love them. I say we we love keep a lot of it out of their mailbox. We keep a lot of it out of their mailbox, but unfortunately, it 
it, sooner or later, it's going to get there. Our tools are only so effective and our endpoint protection is only so effective. Sure. That, that's where you have to trust your people. You have to invest in your people. You got to have good controls and, and tools in place to help prevent detect. So we all love, uh, we all love 2FA until uh, we get hit seven times to re-log in. <laughs> like, God, I hate you. Yeah. I think that's for, that that causes MFA fatigue. Is sure, it? right? I've tried to you know we single sign on is kind of the way of everything we do. We like to use single sign on, but they're, they're, that's a blessing and a curse. Sure, because because the minute you got to start changing passwords, it's like oh there, oh and there, yeah. Oh and I'm oh and on my iPad. <laughs> Oh shit, my iPhone too, right? You're like, uh, but look here. Here's the reality. I, I think we have candid conversations with our people about why we do that, why why it's important to change their password, right? Don't use a password. Tell a story with your password. Mm-hmm. I think those things resonate with people. Uh, you know, again, I, as I started said earlier, I've got a lot of people that are really talented with hammers and saws and levels and and carpentry tools. I, I'm putting digital tools in their hands, mm-hmm. right? I know my I know my greatest risk is my employees on their cell phone because it's a smaller surface. And you don't pay it the same level of attention as you would on a bigger screen. We tell people that. We say, hey, your risk is you're in a hurry with your cell phone. you got to slow down. you got to understand, oh, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. And don't click on it because it might be us testing you. Right. Right? Those are the conversations we have with our people. And they respond to that, right? I, I, I jokingly tell them they're my cyber deputies. Everybody's my cyber dep. I need everybody, right? It works. But see, I, I you're, people you're a attention. rare breed. You're a rare breed. I hear, you know, I talk to, I talk to hundreds of people and we hear stories all the time. And a lot of, like, a lot of people don't empower the people that aren't supposed to be empowered with this stuff and they need to be. And no, it's, 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 uh, it's refreshing to hear that. I don't think any successful leader in whether you're an IT or not, right, it's a people business. Sure. It starts there. It has, it has to start there. If I want them to take care of my customer experience, I've got to create a positive uh, employee experience. And so, you know, I think cybersecurity is, is one leg of that, but culture is important there, right? That, that's kind of what I love with the, the Hanson's team. We, we took a business that was founder led and we've transformed a lot of areas of that business. Um, that's helpful. Yeah. No right? it's, it's helpful to have those. You know, it's, it's a resume plug, if you will. I don't know how much longer I'm going to do it, but as long as I'm having fun, I keep going. As long as, uh, you know, I got the new needs and now I, now I got another 10 years in me. So otherwise I was ready to go, but now I'm like, <laughs> yeah, listen, I, I, a couple more for me. I'm, 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 I'm probably ready to, you know, I'll be married 30 years in the spring. I'm, I'm probably ready to not have to carry, you know, be on call and sure. go travel a bit and see parts of the world we haven't seen yet. So we'll so, see how it all shakes out. So talk to me about, uh, Sim Detroit and Michigan technology leaders. Obviously, I know you know I, I know them all. I've seen them all around. Um, talk, you know, talk to me about your uh, your involvement with them. Yeah, so I've been around Sim for a long time, and 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 for any IT leader in Detroit or where they have a Sim chapter, you know, you you need people who think like you do, who probably aren't in your business, and so the way you get that is with networking. And so, if you look at Sim Detroit arguably the foremost network in Detroit for an IT leader. Um, you know, there's 264 members, uh, a growing chapter. Uh, you know, part of our ethos, though, is making a difference in the community. And we've done that in small scale over the years by supporting some local charities. We really decided in 2023 we were going to we were gonna go big time. And uh, I can remember sitting around a table uh, in December and we were going to have a spring event and we were like, well, can we do this? Can we can we pull this off? Will we get? Will we be successful? And a group of us just rolled up our sleeves and said, hey, hey, let's go, let's do this, and we'll know if we don't get traction, then we'll know. And I can remember we set a deadline. Uh, we set a deadline in March, and on March fourth, we had the money. That was the sign to me that said March fourth, let's go, right? So 2024 is year two of Michigan Technology Leaders. It's a volunteer-led effort to just bring the IT community together. Um, what, what I love about it more than that is it's a great day of networking and learning and growing, but 100% of the net proceeds go back to STEM charities in the Detroit area. Nice. 
So whether that's the Michigan Council of Women in Technology or Perscalis or Code 313, um, we funded the Cloud Security Alliance uh, Rajiv Das Scholarship Fund. Uh, nice. Raj was a, was a good friend to many. So, so I, what I love about it is there's an ethos of service and an ethos of giving back. And you know, there's there's a, a group of leaders were involved last year, and there's different leaders involved this year. And it's just the the team forms and is really laser focused. So April 11th is year two. It'll be at one campus, Martius, uh, downtown Detroit. Yeah. We're going to bring some really smart people to the, to the stage to learn and grow, to educate the community. Uh, but more importantly, we'll, we're going to celebrate another day of charitable giving. And uh, Last year we gave $94,000. Oh my God. Uh, our goal this year is over a hundred. We're well on pace to get that. And and really, I, what I love about it is it's everybody who's involved. They're they're successful leaders, right? But they understand that a, a, a core responsibility when you're successful is to help that next and future generations. And so, if you look at it, we we help the Detroit Public Schools Foundation. We provide kids a pathway to college. Um, Michigan Council of Women in Technology, we, girls, uh, well underserved in in STEM careers. Um, you know, we're, we're providing those resources. Sim Detroit runs the Rise Mentorship Program, which is emerging leaders and companies. And you know, I, I think they're, they've they'll fill up this class again, and it's, it's it's a very powerful program where they bring together sitting CIOs and CISOs and IT leaders with the community, but they partner them with an emerging leader and an organization just to be an unofficial sounding board and understand what someone's thinking about and what their challenges are. But more importantly, how do you overcome those? How do you, how do you get a different perspective if you are only see what's inside your company? So there's a group of leaders that just stand up and make themselves available for this program to really coach and mentor and, and, and help lift people up in the, in the company they're at or the next opportunity for them. And that's, that's a pretty powerful program. No, I love it. We used to, we dabbled with something called the career Academy. We wanted to, you know, if you were in a dead end career and you wanted a new job in it, this is when they were hiring people off the street, you know, it's a little di- different world now. The job market's a little different, but no, uh, simdetroit.org, correct? Sir, I will. I'll put it in the show notes as well. Steve, can't thank you enough for being a first time podcast doer. You're you're an old seasoned pro. Uh, so I can't I can't uh, thank you enough for your time. But hey, Steve York, one eight hundred Hansons. Look him up on uh, LinkedIn or don't and don't call him at work. Uh, we'll 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 figure that one out. Um, but no, thanks. Uh, appreciate the time uh, most definitely. On be on behalf of Bob and Randy, do us all a favor. Drink up your drinks. Get your phone numbers. You don't got to go home. You just got to get the hell out of here. See you next week. Drive careful beat it.